Welcome to the Pitcher Shop. What we're trying to do is bring you as much information as we possibly can to help you, whether you're a player or coach or parent or just interested in learning more about pitching in the game of baseball. We have a number of guests that are in baseball, but in different professions, so we can bring you as many viewpoints as possible. That's our goal. And we're launching it with Dr. Kellen Lee. Dr. Kellen Lee, he is the mental skills coach for the Seattle Mariners. He was the mental skills coach for the San Francisco Giants for about three years. And he also is a professor at Holy Names University in Oakland, California, and is then transferring to the Dominican University of California. And I think that what you'll find in this episode is some great insight for someone that's really attacking that mental skills, that mental part of the game, which is so crucial in the game of baseball. And the way that Dr. Lee describes everything and the detail that he goes into, it, it, it is unbelievable how helpful that is. And he simplifies it down so that even I can understand it. So I hope that you enjoy this episode with Dr. Kellen Lee. Again, he's the mental skills coach for the Seattle Mariners, and this is the guy that we're choosing to kick off and launch the Pitcher Shop podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to the Pitcher Shop. This is where we discuss nothing but pitching, the physical, the mental, arm care, strength, you name it. Our goal is to help you and your overall pitching development. Sit back, listen, because you might just learn something. Well, I guess here we go. Hey, welcome to the Pitcher Shop podcast. Uh, for those of you who have followed us, you know we have social media, Twitter, YouTube channel, Facebook, and then, of course, the thepitchershop.com. The thepitchershop.com is a website. It's an online database that has all of the information that we can possibly bring you from all aspects of pitching to help with your overall pitching development, both physical and, most importantly, mental. And since we, we just touched on how mental is what I think is the most important, I'm honored to have a, a guest here with us, Dr. Kellen Lee, who uh, is currently with the Seattle Mariners as the team sports psychologist coming from the San Francisco Giants. Dr. Lee, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing really good. And you don't have to keep it formal. Just call me Kellen. Uh, I do have the, that PhD, but um, you can just call me Kellen. And I'm just really excited to, to talk about the mental game and and share uh, share some insights, share some experiences of, of what I've learned along the way, and um, you know help anybody who's listening on the podcast just uh, dial in their mental game a little bit better. That's great. So I'll I'll try to keep it uh, semi formal, I guess. It'll just <laughs> slip out. I may call you Sir Doctor Lee, but I'll I'll try to, to stick to Kellen as best I can. I Sounds good. It. So uh, so now obviously coming from from San Francisco and being with that organization for a few years, and then now this is going to be your first year with the Seattle Mariners, how's that transition been? I mean, how's it been from, from the Giants organization to the Mariners organization, you still kind of get used to it? I mean, just a little bit on, on that. Yeah, so uh, I spent three years with the San Francisco Giants as a mental skills coach. Um, it was an incredible experience. It's just an unbelievable organization, total first class, uh, just full of incredible people, both on the staff side and the player side. Um, so make it, making the change, you know, change is always a little bit scary, but um, I think uh, I, I'm really, really excited about uh, becoming a Seattle Mariner this year um, and really helping that organization take a step forward um, and just really support them as uh, in, in, in any way that I, that I possibly can as, as a mental skills coach. You know, essentially my job is to help uh, the players focus on the right thing at the right time so that they can uh, perform to the best of their ability. Um, in addition to, you know, teaching the coaches a thing or two about the, the mental game and see how we can all collaborate to get on the same page uh, to help the players perform and ultimately the organization thrive. So um, it's, you know, it's, like I said, transition can be a little scary at times, but um, I'm really excited about the opportunity and the challenge to, to jump over to a, a really, you know, solid, amazing organization so far. I've learned a lot just in the short time I've been there, and I look forward to an awesome year with them. That's great. That's great. That's a good answer. And even if it wasn't going well, I'm sure you're smart enough to give that very <laughs> good answer right there. So I know you said change is scary, um, and, and I, I agree with you too, but, but I would imagine you have to get your mind right to accept that change, and I'm sure there's nobody who's better at that than you. Um, yeah. You yeah. Know, so, so as you, you know, as, it's interesting to me. I mean, I think it's so cool being that mental skills coach and just getting at the level that you're at. I mean, you're talking about 
you're you're with a professional baseball team, a professional sports team, the cream of the crop. I mean, there you are. And and like I said, I think that is so cool. You know, how how did you get there? I mean, you know, how did you, you know, did you always say, hey, you know what, I want to go into professional sports or professional baseball? Or is it something that kind of fell into your lap along the way? You know, how, what's the background on you with, with how you ended up in the, at this level? Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a combination of a lot of my own personal experiences um, with the concept with the content of you know sports psychology mental skills, um, but also it really just I I, fo- I followed the bouncing ball. I talked to a lot of people within the organiz or within the the industry of doing this work, and I and I found a, I found a way to pave my own path. So um, taking us taking all all the way back to my college days at UC San Diego, go Tritons, uh, played baseball there. Uh, and my job, my, my coach did an unbelievable job at UC San Diego introducing us, uh, my, and myself and my team, uh, to the, the mental game principles. Dan O'Brien, got to give him a shout out. Um, he just did an unbelievable job, you know, bringing that content to life for us. And it really sparked my interest because I, I reached a level of performance that I never really thought was possible for myself. Um, and I, and I solely attribute it to my ability to, to, you utilize uh, the mental skill set that I've come to, to love and, and teach to this day. So uh, as, a, as a young student athlete, it really sparked my interest. And I realized that this field of sports psychology was a thing by talking to people and, you know, figuring out like, you know, this, this could be something that I might want to do. Um, so at that time, uh, dad, uh, Coach O'Brien got, got the, the head job at Santa Clara University. So I came up with him and worked on staff as the ops guy as I, fin- as I began my grad school a master's program in sports psychology. And at the time, I really didn't know whether I wanted to go into coaching or if I want to do the mental skills work. Um, but we went to the ABCA conference um, in 2012 uh, in Anaheim. And I stumbled into a presentation. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was, again, a fresh graduate, you know, not really sure where I wanted to fit into the sports world. And I stumbled into a presentation of, a, of someone who was doing mental skills work in professional baseball. And I was like, that's exactly what I want to do, hearing about what he did and his job. And, and again, I was a really eager, motivated, soon-to-be graduate student. So it could have been a more perfect time for me to spark that interest and get that inspiration. Um, so then, you know, fast forward to, to today or, you know, in along that journey, um, I, I worked with a ton of different athletes, you know, through my master's program. And when I finished that, uh, I did three, I worked uh, three years doing mental skills training with the United States Army, which was an incredible experience. Um, and that in that in that time frame is when I went decided to go back to school like a crazy person and get my PhD in performance psychology because um, I just realized my my formal education and learning wasn't done yet. Um, and then you know beginning of 2020 got the job with the Giants spent three of the years with them and now in 2023 uh, officially Seattle Mariner. So I again I, I've been you know working with a lot of different people different levels high school athletes youth athletes the college professional. Even a few, um, you know, people who are qualifying for the Olympics. I, I've kind of really been all over the place. Worked with just some incredible performers in, in their fields, um, but really, it all started from myself seeing the benefit as a player um, and realizing, you know, how beneficial this content can be. And I just wanted to help people realize their full potential by, you know, training them on some of the stuff that I saw beneficial for me, and now I know and seen it firsthand how it can really impact people's careers. Uh, that's a that's a great answer, and so and, and now I feel like I know exactly how you got where you are. Um, you know, you mentioned UC San Diego with Coach O'Brien. I've always heard good things about him, um, and then I, I was aware when he went to Santa Clara. I pay attention to the WCC. I, I pitched at St. Mary's College. So oh, okay, yeah, I was right. Yeah, I was right there. And it's funny you mentioned Anaheim in 2012 for that coaches convention because I was there also. Because I oh excellent. Coach. So um, that's just that's funny. It's a small small world, especially very that small coaching. world. It very yeah. co- and, and again, like like I mentioned, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I first graduated, and I, and I I hear that story a lot from from collegiate collegiate players. You know, ba- again, I talked to a lot of baseball players. I'm like, I don't really know what I want to do. I'm like, I had no idea, but I realized through my experience, through you know, getting to hear people at conferences like that, I'm like, wow, like that was what I needed to push me in the right direction, and I realized that. I didn't want to coach in college, which is also a great realization because I wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know. Um, but working as the ops guy at Santa Clara, I realized I don't want to be on the road recruiting all the time. That's not my jam. I don't really feel like that's going to be something I'm going to thrive at. Um, do you think I, I do? I think I could have coached. Yes, absolutely. Do 
do I think I could coach in the future? Sure. But I, at the, for the time being, I know I made the right choice because I, I absolutely love what I do. Um, and it's so, it's so rejuvenating and so, uh, so just exciting on a daily basis. Cause I get to do, you know, a lot of cool stuff with these guys, like you said, the cream of the crop. And, um, I look forward to like kind of diving a little bit more into what that looks like, but, um, I definitely made the right choice. I think so far. I, I, I agree with you there. Look where you are. <laughs> I, I think you're yeah. right. So, um, no, that's, that's awesome. And so now at this time, you're actually, you're, you're getting ready to, to head into spring training, right? Yeah, so th this is that time of year. I'm headed out there um, next week, um, and it'll be a back to the grind of, of spring training. But it's a fun grind um, getting to really build uh, relationships, because especially for me in this particular situation with a new organization, um, I don't know any of the players. Right. And it'll be a great time. Like spring training is a fabulous time to spend day in and day out every single day, all day with these players to build that foundational relationship. So you know, once the season get gets rolling, we can really hit the ground running on, on diving into some of these important topics. No, that's great. I'm sure it's a very exciting time because you're going to get to know those players. They're trying to, to get to know you and, and, and establishing those relationships as you're getting into the season. So, yeah, spring training, this is a, a huge time. And so, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because then you're, you're going into a new organization. You don't know anybody uh, really, you know, and, and then the approach that you're going to take. I mean, you have – do you have an idea of how you're going to approach those conversations with certain, you know, pitchers specifically um, of just, hey, this is what we want to talk about when it comes to the mental side of the game. I mean, where, how do you know where to start with each guy? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's the tough part. The, the first part um, I would say is for me, I have to understand their understanding of their mental game first, because if. If I facilitate the conversation, or if I come in guns blazing and go like, you should do this, you should do this, you should do right. this, from like a mental skill set standpoint, they're going to look at me like, who is this guy? Like, I, who, yeah. what, was he? is he trying to change everything? Like, what do we got here? Right. So I think it's very, very important for me to be very, uh, very intentional about how I initiate that conversation. And I think like, from a foundational standpoint, I would say that I think the starting point for really anybody is just help them build the awareness that the mental game exists. Like, ask very intentional questions around like, you know, something very simple, like, well, how much do you think the game is mental? Like what percentage? And for the listeners out there, I've asked that question hundreds of times and I've never had a professional player, really anybody answer less than 50 or 60%. Hmm. Most believe that most of the game is mental. And then I follow up with the question, like, well, how much, what percentage of the time do you, that you train for the game of baseball, do you spend on the mental side of the game? And it's, very much, much less than 60%. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> most of the time, less than 10 if I if I threw out a number. Wow. And essentially, my job is to close that gap where if someone believes, let's just say it's 70% mental, and they say they spend 10% of their time training the mental side of the game, I will never tell them, you need to spend 70% of your time training the mental side of the game. And I, my job is literally a mental skills coach. I would never say that. But what I will say is like, wouldn't it make sense to close that gap a little bit to where you believe the game is 70% mental, that's likely not going to change. And you train it 10%. Let's just train it 15% of the time, just do a little bit more, so that you can get closer to that full potential. So that's like, that's, again, establishing that foundation aware, foundational awareness that the mental game exists, because you told me it did, because I asked you the question. And now let's find different ways to, to build the, the different aspects of the mental game after you tell me that it exists, and that the majority of the game is mental. Um, but really, like I said, it's, and, and from that, from that conversation or from that question is really a springboard into m the conversation from my part where I facilitate, um, my understanding of their understanding. Like that is really, really important because most of the people that I work with in professional athletes or professional sports, they, they do a lot of helpful strategies. They utilize a lot of things that I would say, um, facilitate their, their full potential. My job is to help them do those strategies more often, more efficiently and better. So I, I, a lot of times, I, don't get me wrong. I do teach a lot. I teach a lot about the mental game. I teach different strategies, but a lot of times I'm just helping them refine what they already do so they can do it more consistently. Um, so I find a balance, right? Because if I go in and I get the vibe that the player has a much like smaller understanding of their mental game and they don't really, they don't have a, their, maybe their self-awareness is a little bit lower then perhaps I do a little bit more teaching with my approach. 
But if I come across a player who's highly self-aware and understands exactly what he's, do what he's doing, very intentional about his process, then for him, I, my approach is going to be completely different because I need to make sure that I'm understanding their understanding. So that's why I wanted to throw that up first because um, there's really no one size fits all. It's really just understanding where they are so I can help facilitate whatever their needs are in that moment. No, that, that makes complete sense. I think what, what's interesting to me is, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to get it across to them that, hey, the mental skills approach, it's exactly that. It's a skill, right? So you spend so much time on the physical part of your skill, right? Mastering that crap. But yet we're saying, like you said, hey, everybody's saying it's at least 50, 60 percent of the game is, is mental. So and, and dedicating less than 10 percent of that of practicing that skill um, it, it seems like that's just the only thing you need to get across to them, really, you know, as a simpleton like myself, just, hey, understand, you got to put time into to perfecting this skill, just like you are with, with hitting or pitching, you know, and, and executing your location. I mean, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, no, very, very interesting. And, and the, the one size fits all approach, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's it goes hand in hand with baseball in general, right? I mean, you can't teach every pitcher to throw exactly the same way with exactly the same grip. It just doesn't work that way because everybody's different and unique in their own way. So um, it to makes total sense. I mean, I, I, I get that. That's that's great. So so as you you know as you talk to these guys and you, you get to know them and and it's finding out uh, a little bit more of, of who they are as an individual and, and what makes them you know kind of kind of refocus and everything. You know, are there any kind of general tips or techniques that that you'll that you found to be very helpful with guys that are struggling with getting their focus back on track when they're, when they're in competition or even, even in a bullpen when they're kind of losing it a little bit. Yeah. I think um, like, like I said, there is really no one size fits all, but I think if from a general standpoint, um, I think that goes like, like goes across the board, whether you're position players or pitchers um, is just establishing and sticking to a consistent between pitch process. And that process might look very, very different for players um, and like, essentially if, if people are listening to this, they're like, okay, what, what is he actually talking about? Here's exactly what I'm talking about. It's helping them identify what they need to think, feel emotionally and do physically between every pitch to stay as consistent as possible. And that includes maybe thoughts about their game plan, how they're going to, how they're going to like, what's the sequence that this, this, this hitter requires from a pitching standpoint or from a hitting standpoint. What, what is this pitcher tend to throw in these particular situations? It could be like a tactical based thought. That's fine. I can't tell you what you need to think, feel, and do, but starting and putting those, putting them in those three buckets just helps them identify like, okay, so I'm being more consistent with what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm doing to prepare myself for, for my, to, to compete one pitch at a time. We hear that all the time. Got to play one game, one game of the game, one pitch at a time. It's absolutely spot on. But it's, it's really, really hard to do that if you aren't focusing on the time between pitches. And that's the key, is managing that time between pitches is the first and foremost, one of the most foundational aspects of the mental game. And it all starts with what you think, what you feel, and what you do. And if you simplify it down to those three aspects, players tend to, it, it brings the mental game to light a little bit. Because if you think about like the mental game and mental skills and mental performance, those are all very subjective, very gray area topics. So get, simplifying it down to what you're thinking, feeling, and doing brings it makes it a little bit more black and white for players and easier to understand. And ultimately, you know, peek behind the curtain. What I'm saying with your what with identifying what you're thinking, feeling, and doing, I'm helping them build self awareness. That's all I'm doing, so that they can identify like these are some helpful thoughts to make get me in the right mindset to compete. These are my helpful emotions to help get me in the right physical and emotional state to compete and what I'm doing, you know, whether that's, you know, adjusting my batting gloves, adjusting my, my whatever, doing your thing, uh, you know, clearing out the rubber is a, is a common one for pitchers or something like that. I, I don't, I don't really care what you do as long as it's consistent and it's helpful and you can be honest with that process. So, uh, or honest with yourself, me, like being that process is helpful for you. So, yeah, I mean, that, that would be like the one thing is just establishing that consistent between pitch process um, to be able to execute consistently, because at the end of the day, a uh, consistent mindset typically yields consistent performance. And that's all we're shooting for in this in this line of work is just being consistent. 
Yep, no, I, I think you nailed it. And I think especially with, with talking about that time in between pitches, and you mentioned how pitchers will kind of clear the dust off the rubber or they're adjusting something or hitters or whatever. I guess we, you know, I always try to teach that that's your pre-pitch routine. You know, what is the routine that you have? Once you get that ball back, it's got to be consistent. And a lot of pitchers, I've found, don't quite understand that at a younger level, you know, high school guys, college guys. But, um, you know, I always say, well, look at, look at the batter. Right. What's the hitter doing when he gets into the box? Is he doing the same thing every time, or is he is he getting in, you know, left foot first but one time, right foot first the other time? No, he's doing the same thing because he's trying to get his mind right to get ready to crush you. That's what he's doing. That's so, it. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> so very uh, very interesting. I, I like that. So I like that that time between pitches and focusing on that and simplifying it. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so great. Now now when <clears throat> we talked about kind of in the game. And I would imagine that if you're getting your mind right before the game starts, it's going to help you. It's going to make it easier for you while you're in the game to, to gain control of your mind, prevent you kind of spiraling out of control, right? Like the great Ken Revisa had said. Um, so, so what are the what kind of things do you do do with guys or or show them to try to help them get their mind right before the game happens to help them just be under control with their mind and body a little bit better? Yeah, I think um, breaking it down to, you know, compartmentalizing between pregame, during game and post game, I think is really, really important to make sure that they're um, setting themselves up for success, regardless of the of the context, whether it's pre, during or post. And I think before the game, um, it's a combination of what I would bring to the table and what their what their what their skill coaches will bring to the table, what their strength coaches will bring to the table, and really just a very collaborative effort. And Essentially, like in general, if the player addresses the physical skill set with his, you know, his his mobility work with his strength coach or athletic trainer or with his skill coach, um, and then addresses the tactical aspects of the game, so the strategy behind the game, and that's typically with their manager or their skill coaches, and then the mental, so the physical, tactical, and mental. If you hit those three buckets, it's more likely that's going to assist someone to compete better mid game. So. I, again, I, I can't write out like a, a mental game prescription, just like hand it to somebody. What I do throw out is like, hey, like if you dial in your physical skill set, it's going to be easier to trust yourself in the game. If you know the scouting report inside and out from a tactical standpoint, you understand your plan, what you're trying to execute, either from the pitching side or the position player side, it's easier for you to compete mid game because you're able to trust that plan. And then from the mental side, giving you the skill sets and, and the techniques to be able to be in control of your mind and body will allow your physical skill set to show up more consistently and be able to allow you to execute the tactical aspects that you're trying to shoot for. So it's, it's, it's like essentially a triangle where they dial in their physical skill set, they understand the tactics of the game, and their mental game is kind of the link between the two to allow those aspects of the game to show up more consistently. So on giving them the mental skill set, and that can include breathing techniques, that can, can include visualization, that can include um, focal points, cues, a, a million different like combinations or to build that mental game recipe, so to speak, um, that could be thrown in, thrown into the, as ingredients. But ultimately, the goal is to be able to control the mind, to control the body so that the physical and the tactical can show up more consistently. And that's that, 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 that relationship between all three, because really nothing nothing happens independent from each other. And it's important to understand that all three are playing a factor in performance. Um, but again, from my lens, from my perspective, you know, addressing the mental side of the game, it's really, really hard to execute something if you're focused on something else. So I really simplify it down to, if you're able to, to lock in on your plan, your physical skill set is going to show up more consistently. And it's really that, it, to me, it's that simple, but it's not easy to do. And there's a difference. Right. But um, that's ultimately how I start that conversation when they're asking me, like, hey, like, how should I mentally prepare for a game? I'll give them those three buckets. I'll give them strategies within the mental game because, you know, the physical and the tactical are really outside my lane. And I'll push them to the right people to get that dialed in. But I will I will give them everything I can to fill up that mental game bucket uh, so that the other two can show up, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it, it makes complete sense. And and. Um, just being able to, to simplify the way that you, you're doing it for, for me and for forever, whoever's listening, it, it makes, it makes it so much easier, 
to understand the mental game or to start to understand what kind of skills we're trying to build and then why we're trying to do it. So, and, and you touched on something, you're talking about, you know, mind, body, and then the physical part, um, you know, for, for pitchers, when I'm, I still, when I'm instructing them, the, the one thing that I always tell them, if I, and because you just said it, I'm going to say, look, I, I know I got one thing right. And it's just, hey, if we can't control our mind, then we can't control our body. And if we can't control our body, we, we're not going to be able to command the strike zone. We just can't consistently execute our location pitch after pitch if this is out of control because then, you know, we're, we're flying everywhere. So, um, so I'm, I'm glad you said that. So I'm not fully crazy. So uh, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, now, now, when you're talking about all of these things, do you find a, a difference with um, with new guys? And but one is say a, a veteran. You know, maybe he's he's six, seven, eight years in the league, and then you've got a rookie that's that's one or, or two years in the league. I mean, do you do you find their receptiveness to the ideas different? Um, you know, one more than the other. Or? I would say like the comparing. I'll put younger players into yeah. one bucket and older players into another bucket. Um, when comparing the two groups of players by age, I would say there's multiple factors that would lead to either more open-mindedness, less open-mindedness, or more coachability, less coachability when it comes to the mental game. And I would say that some of the key ones are previous experience with training the mental side of the game. I would say that if a player has had a really great experience or came from an organization that has a, like a really robust mental performance program, it's really easy to get in there. Like, Hey, you know, those people that were doing that for the other organization, I'm that guy. So let's like continue doing, and you tell me what you know. Right. And that that's, again, sometimes that's the approach that I'll take with some of the older guys. Another approach that I'll, I might take with some older guys is, you know, sometimes, and this is like a more human experience that I'm going to explain is when we hear something, and we've heard it before, sometimes we'll go like, I've already heard that before. And we just kind of like tune it out and let it right. go. So to get ahead of that, I'll go, all right, guys, listen, I know you're all experienced. I know you've been around the block a little bit. You probably have a very like locked in process. So there might be things that I say that you already know, and that's fantastic. I'm just here to help you do that more often and perhaps give you like one or two more things just to consider. And right. some and the feedback that I've gotten from some of the older players are like, we just appreciate that approach because it's not like you're telling us to do all this new things and you're 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 praising us for already having this established and you're just here to support us and they they appreciate that approach as well. But when it comes to the newer players, um, it really just all starts with awareness of what the mental game is, how it impacts their performance, and really just as simple as asking something like, when you're thinking about your previous at bat during your current at bat, how does that impact performance? And like, just just one example, that's just one of many, many examples that you can come out. But most players will go like, wow, like, yeah, if I'm thinking about my previous at bat, it's really hard to execute my current at bat. Or from a pitching standpoint, if you're thinking about your previous inning while you're competing in the, in the current inning, it's just really hard to compete. And that is a very elementary concept but it brings the mental game to life for someone who's maybe has never been exposed to it, never even thought about it, never even considered it. Um, so that's why, you know, my answer to that one question is really getting an understanding of their understanding of the mental game first so that I can just put like, take a pulse and go, all right, what do I need to do in this situation? Because their knowledge is not going to change in that moment. And it's up to me to determine what that knowledge set is or what that knowledge level is so that I can adjust my approach accordingly. Um, but really, like, from a buy-in standpoint, I think it's really due to their personal experience with, with the content or with, with uh, the, the skills themselves. Maybe they've, they've seen the benefit like I did as a player. Like, I would have been super open-minded <laughs> to, to somebody like this as a younger, younger player. Um, but really, some players are like, you know what? I don't see a point in that, and I just want to go compete, and I never take it personal, and that's fine. It's, at the end of the day, um, it's, it's really about – uh, giving them the tools that I believe to help them in their career long term, and um, sometimes there are players that are less open minded, and that's okay. But ultimately, just let it get sending the message that regardless, I'm always there for them, no matter what. I will always support them in their journey um, and give them whatever they might need um, in the moment. So 
yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of different approaches, but really it just it boils back down to that that answer of just understanding their understanding first and and going going with the flow and seeing where the conversation takes us. I think that's a, a wise approach. It's just hey, I'm gonna let me get to know you first, and then I'm gonna adapt to you and your style. And 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 instead of you know, like I always say, I don't understand why people in in any field just feel the need that hey, I gotta just jam it all down your throat, and you gotta understand it, and you gotta you need to pay attention and listen to it and do it. It doesn't make any sense because I have the personality where it's like, well, if you're going to tell me that, I'm going to go ahead and go over here on my own and figure something else out, right? And, I I've, and I've made that mistake. I've made yeah. that mistake where I'm like, I have all this great stuff and I want to share it, which yeah. is true. I, 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 I truly believe that I have some great stuff that I can share that I can help, but the timing and how I go about it matters. Right. And I've learned that over time where I, I have to like, I have to like pump the brakes on my, my eagerness at times because sometimes it's not the right time for the player. And ultimately, it's about them. It's not me. It's not about me. So I have to be able to be very calculated and intentional about when I approach those moments. Um, otherwise, it, it's just not going to stick. And what I, what I want to stick is not going to. So I've just I've learned that where I just have to get the understanding for them from them first, and then we can go from there. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. And, and with those, you know, when you're talking just real quick about the younger guys or some guys that, that haven't been as receptive to the idea of, of en enhancing their mental skills or, you know, whether it comes from you or from somebody else, have, have you found that, you know, some or, or most of those guys, when they do struggle, do they eventually come around and think that, hey, maybe I should try this out and buy into it a little bit more and then have success after they have? Um, or is it, are they still just kind of the same old stubborn mules of just, I'm going to do it this way. And, you know, I, I got here without it. I'll just figure it out on my own. It's, it's really all over the board. I've, I've had yeah. players that have been, yeah, I don't need this transition to Kellen. I, I need to talk about this all the time to yeah. I've had players where I don't, they go from, I don't need this to, or they stay at, I don't need this. And that, and that's just, that's their choice. So I just think like, um, you know, if you, the majority, like I'm looking at the majority, the majority right. of players, once that awareness exists that, you know, what they're thinking about mid game matters and influences the quality of their performance, they'll at least do something to address it. Um, that again, that's a really blanket statement, but that's what I've seen is it all starts with just the basic understanding that what you're focusing on, what you're thinking about will impact the quality of whatever you're doing and Let's be real. Executing pitching mechanics and executing a swing in the game of baseball is a very is a highly complex process, and it's really really important to allow our minds to facilitate and not debilitate that process. So, again, it's 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 a, it's a byproduct of having really intentional conversations and really diving deep into what goes into performing well, um, and a huge aspect of that is simply what they're thinking about. So. Um, just again, it all starts with awareness. I think I've said awareness like seven times, but that's really where it yeah, starts. That's fine. No, no one's counting. It was only yeah, eight. yeah. It's it's just it's probably more. Um, but it's really it all starts with that and 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 helping them realize that they can use their mind to their advantage. Because so often do people think about like, oh, I got in my own head, or I'm in my own head, or you know, I overanalyze, I overthought. But there are moments where, like, very rarely do we talk about the moments that we did well in. Right. Um, and the the same attention uh, should be given to those moments. And it's really all about just tuning. It's like thinking about our thinking is a very weird concept, but it's so critical when it comes to um, this game and, and really facilitating consistent performance. Yeah, no, no I think you're right in, in terms of, you know, we always want to focus more on the, I guess, on the negatives, what we did wrong, and because we're going, hey, we really need to fix this. But it is equally important to to figure out, hey, what did we do well? So when I have a pitcher, I always ask, hey, how the how did the outing go? Oh, I did horrible. Okay, well, what did you do well? You know, let's let's find out one or two things, and then focus on that for a minute, build on that, and now let's talk about what you didn't do well, and really work on those things. So, um, yeah, no, so that, uh, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and, and, you know, with those, with those young guys that, that may be a little green to that, that mental skills, do you find that, you know, obviously it's going to help 
if they can learn it as a, at a younger age. It, what's too young in your opinion? Or, or I guess in other words, when do you think the uh, people or kids should start being introduced to the mental skills uh, for baseball? Wow. Um, so I, I can I can speak I with this question, I'm going to answer it in a couple different ways. So I can speak as a parent of a young kid and I can speak from like what I what I've done from a professional standpoint. So um, as a parent, my, my son is uh, he'll he'll be six here in a couple of weeks. Um, he plays every sport under the sun and loves baseball. And I've started to introduce a lot of just like very basic elementary stuff to him and. Um, and he surprises me with what how much he can understand he really does and you know simple things like you know he's playing basketball currently and he's like you know when i shoot a free throw it's really important to focus and he said that to me one day and i was like well why what do you mean like why is it important to focus and he said well it allows it helps me make the shot and again for him that's the surface level understanding right. but there's so many layers under that that he's absolutely spot on to yeah like He's not going to be able to articulate, well, it helps me like completely lock my, lock my, uh, my sights and my focus and I'm able to execute my, the mechanics of my shot. He's not going to talk about that, but right. he's like, he's realized that he's like, if I really focus on what I'm doing, I'm able to do what I want to happen. And there's a lot of power to That's that. Yeah. And I think like, um, it, it really, the, the cool part about, uh, and, and the, the, like the, the, the way I'll answer the question is more like what I've done professionally is like being able to strip down the concepts to the very basic elementary, um, you know, root of what we're talking about, I think could be applied to really anybody. And as, as, as young as, you know, four or five, when I started talking to my son about this stuff, um, but really like it's, and if you listen to, if you listen to coaches, this is another thing I do when I go to his practices or I watch youth games or, or high school games. I listen to coaches. Almost every single one of them talks about something mental game related or listen to interviews. If people like watching interviews of athletes or coaches on ESPN or anything like that, very often do they talk about preparation? Do they talk about focus? Do they talk about staying calm? They talk about um, all of those things. Those are all mental game principles. So I think the more you just talk about the importance of, you know, focusing on what you're doing or perhaps like implementing a deep breath before you go do something that's really important. You can, you can change the way you talk about some of the, the, the mental skills to apply to really any age. Um, you know, they, they might not fully like my son, he might not fully understand like why focusing helps him, but he knows he, he knows it does. He's gone through it. He's practiced it. He just realizes that when he's distracted, He's not as good at whatever sport he's doing. Um, so th those are like little tips that I can that I can give for any parents or just coaches of young kids, like being able to to understand. Well, what do you want the what do you want these kids to to know, and how can you simplify the message down to their understanding, right? And so to answer your question, I don't really know if there is anything too young in terms of just getting like introducing some of these concepts. Um, but it's all about like how you deliver that material so they can understand it. Yeah. And that, and that that's again, simplified very well and, and makes complete sense to me. My, my son's 19 months and he doesn't quite get it yet. So I no, not yet. <laughs> yeah, you know, I know it's, I'm not disappointed yet. So no, uh, no. And, and so my, so my daughter is just a, a little bit over two. So very close to the 19 months age. And, you know, she's just starting to talk, like learning right. to talk So like, They'll, they'll be a little bit different and maybe like six months or even a year from now when she, you know, if she wants to play some sports, like maybe I'll start talking about it. But right. again, like I really think like if I was going to put a number on it, I don't know, age three, three and a half, where they have a little bit more of mind of their own and they can start thinking about critical thinking critically about things like you can start talking about focus. You can start talking about taking a deep breath. Those are all very elementary things that anyone can do. All right. I guess when you think about it, it's, it's when they're young. I mean, you're trying to talk to them as a normal person and read read to them and, and, and teach them words and everything. It's the same approach, really. I mean, totally. They may not understand exactly what you're talking about. Like, I don't expect my son to go like, oh, yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense. Thanks for helping me regain my focus and taking a deep breath <laughs> and relax my body and clear yeah. my mind. Yeah. OK, thanks, Dad. I know he's not doing that yet, but um, but just the introducing it. Um, I think you make a good point is that introducing that early helps. And, and especially for the young guys, because 
as I, as I know you probably believe, I know I'm speaking for you, but I definitely believe that that separator of the elite athletes from even athletes who are just great um, is understanding that concept of the mental game and perfecting those mental skills because that's otherwise they can't compete at that high level uh, for, for as long as they are. And that's, that's my opinion. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, that's, so I, yeah, I, I, like I said, I assume you kind of think the same way on that. (laughs) Yeah. I think, um, it really, like you said, that separator is, is huge. And I think like what, what a good mental game allows you to do is be more consistent with your physical skill set. So that to me is how I, how I break that down where, do I, do I, do I, do I believe that it'll make you better and perform better? Yes. But it's more about consistency yeah. and honestly, consistency is the separator, right? Because if you have a player that's really on a high, high and low lows, their, their career is very volatile. It's going to change. It's going to be really hard to sustain, um, like the, the really high level performance to the really low level performance. Um, it's actually easier to sustain lower level performance, but that's not what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, but really, like the separator is consistency. And I would say that that's what the mental game allows more often to, to show up is just consistent performance. So I couldn't agree more. I think the more you, the more anybody, youth coaches, parent, parents, anything like that, um, you know, push, push the consistency narrative. I think what also that does is it gets, people away from focusing on just the the output or the outcomes or the results of what you're doing and back to like the the pro you know process versus result discussion here but really like pushing the consistency will allow someone to focus more so on their process versus results um, even though results are a metric of performance no doubt and they're important but what's helpful is to really lock in your your focus and put all your attention effort and energy into the process and I think striving for consistency will allow you to do so a little bit more easier and a little bit more streamlined, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. And we always talk about, hey, focus on the process and not the results, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, but I, I like what you just touched on there where you, you kind of, you throw in that word consistency and it helps guys. I think at least in, in my mind, it gives me a better understanding of what it is I'm, I'm trying to do, right? It's like, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, the process, yeah, I'm trying to get better every single day, but it's no, I'm trying to achieve consistency and those results are going to follow. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I like the way that, that you put that. So I, I've got, I've got one more question for you. Um, sure. You know, as those, we were talking about young kids and as they're growing and, and getting bigger and stronger and, um, you know, they're more susceptible to injury, especially if they're not on their, you know, learning the right way to throw correctly or, and then especially guys that are, are in the big leagues and older when they when they do get injured, um, I mean, and they have a hard time coming back just out of that fear of, hey, I'm going to re injure myself, or I don't I don't feel like I'm the same guy. I mean, what what kind of how do you help a guy get get over that hump, that mental hump there when it comes to coming back from injury? Yeah, this is this is a really um, important topic um, when it comes to just like the overall mental game. In fact, side note. Uh, my PhD dissertation was on the mental aspects of sport injury. Um, huh. So this is like, this is my, this is my wheelhouse and kind of like a sub niche within the work that I, I'm really passionate you about. You might have to do another podcast Kellen, <laughs> specifically on injury if, if you'll have it. Cause I, I'm curious to hear more about this and I know we're limited on time. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can, I can give you the, uh, the essential, you know, the essential information here that I think uh, is relevant, but um, first and foremost, um, one of the aspects that was consistent in, in a lot that I read about, um, you know, the psychological aspects of injury is identity around, um, you know, are sometimes athletes will report like, I don't feel like an athlete anymore when they're injured. Um, so what, what I've, how I've taken that like theme and made it more applicable is I, I reinforce with athletes that, that come down with an injury is that you are an athlete with an injury versus an injured athlete. And that small, subtle semantic change and that sh- the shift in the narrative a little bit implies that an athlete with an injury is temporary versus an injured athlete, which is identity based. Huh. So that's just like the one, like one, like the foundational aspect that I try to push with players when they say like, Oh, I'm injured. I'm like, well, let's, let's try to like think about that in a, in a different way. Like, 
could you be like, I have an injury right now? And that makes it more of a temporary state and changes the perspective on what's going on. And I, and I found that to be able to sustain like motivation throughout the rehab process. Um, they're, they're more inspired to like, you know, knock out all that they have to do to come out the other end of the rehab process more like stronger and better and healthy. Um, so that would be like the first thing is like anything to attack just the overall identity and how the person sees themselves in that process um, has shown throughout the research, throughout, you know, my conversations, I, I think it pretty much stays consistent um, with that. But with that said, like during the rehab process, um, they're typically not competing the same way that they have been as uh, someone who's healthy. Mm -hmm. So shifting the perspective to competing within the rehab process, competing against themselves, competing against um, their range of motion, for example, or, um, you know, certain, you know, strength milestones that they want to hit along the way based on their, their PT's guidance, the doctor's guidance, the athletic trainer's guidance, like being able to compete in that context is another way that I, you know, just from a approach standpoint to try to get them to think about that way. But I think like one of the easiest strategies that people can implement in the rehab process is visualization. It's a game changer, super easy, something you can do anytime. Um, because at, for the most part, if an athlete has an injury, they're physically limited to what they can do. Sometimes they're completely out of practice. Sometimes they're limited in practice depending, depending on the nature of the injury. But visualization, aside from any uh, TBI, concussion, you know, related injuries, you're mentally capable of engaging in visualization, which is essentially just seeing yourself do something in your mind before you do it or after you do it, perhaps. But what, 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 what I've discovered in, in reading and, and honestly, my research is that athletes with injuries who engage in visualization actually come out the other end with higher levels of confidence in their own ability to perform in themselves uh and and there's so many more benefits on the back end if they if they increase their number of mental repetitions or visualization throughout the rehab process because at the end of the day like even even non non-injuries in a non-injury situation uh repeti physical repetitions are limited but visualization allows you to make that make that number unlimited by from your mental repetition standpoint so um, even if you're physically limited, you're mentally unlimited is the way I say it when it comes to visualization. Um, so that's another thing you can do is just see yourself compete over and over and over and over. You know, if we're talking pitchers, you know, obviously Tommy John is a very common experience for pitchers. It's, you know, 12 to 15 months of rehab and before you can even get on the mound again. So um, in those moments, like getting on a getting on a visualization plan and really seeing yourself throw off the mound mentally can be a game changer when you tow that rubber for the first time. And it can be a little bit scary. Like you said, fear of re-injury is very real. Um, and visualization ha can, you know, perhaps mitigate some of that or minimize some of that fear. Um, so, yeah, I think like uh, another just basic principle that I throw out to people um, in the rehab process is as weird as it sounds, like plan for expected obstacles because they're going to happen. And the more proactive you are, with planning for the setback or the obstacle or the challenge, the more resilient you're going to be in that moment. So plan proactively for expected obstacles um, and just expect them to happen. And if they don't, great. Awesome. You're on the right track. You'll, you'll be expedited in your return to play. Um, and that's really the only thing. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different ways we can go with this, but I think visualization is a game changer. Thinking about it from an identity standpoint of athlete with an injury versus an injured athlete is really empowering um and you know plan for obstacles because they're likely going to happen so give yourself that plan ahead of time so that you know what to do in the moment yeah i feel like we could talk about that for at least another hour and, and yes we could one of these days we will if, if you'll you'll let us so uh but yeah it's just it's amazing to me the power of the mind um and just what it, it, it's capable of um, I'm still trying to understand mine. I'm, I'm not that smart. I gotta do a little bit more. We're, we're all we're all in that process of understanding our mind. It's a very it's an ongoing lifelong process. That's right. Focus on the process, right? Focus yeah, that's on it. the process. So, that's it. Well, good. Well, uh, you know, Dr. Lee, I, I or I'm sorry, Kellen, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate your time and and just giving us all this information and letting us dive into your mind about how you help the mind of others. And I mean, I, I can't say thank you enough. And I hope that this is going to help a lot of a lot of uh, soon to be 
pro athletes, but just athletes overall in general and coaches and parents understand how important this stuff is for just your, your you know, players overall health and helping them, them be consistent at the next level. So, so thank you very much. And, uh, maybe we can do this again sometime. No, th thank you so much for the time and, and the invitation to jump on here and discuss, um, you know, anytime I can, you know, just build awareness around the, the mental skills and mental performance and sports psychology. I'm all for it. And um, I think it's so cool what you're doing to, to put out resources and information to 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 uh, to the masses um, to, to help people out on, on their game. And, and just I'm honored to be a part of it. And I thank thank you for the conversation and be more than happy to, to break down the and nerd out a little bit on my Ph.D. dissertation research and talk a little bit more psych, psychology of injury and um, it's a, it's been a really cool um, process to really get to know that aspect of the game um, of, of sports psychology and the mental game in general, and just being able to support the players in that very vulnerable time as uh, someone with an injury. It's, it's really cool to, to really support them in that process. Yeah, I can, I, I can imagine, I can imagine. So that's a, that's gotta be a good feeling, especially when they come back and they're healthy and you know, that's, that's gotta feel great. So well, well, thanks again, and, and uh, you know, you can just want to let everybody else know, check us out at thepitchershop.com and the, and the Pitcher Shop podcast. We'll have more people on here like Dr. Kellen Lee and trying to, again, help, help everybody's overall development, both physical but but a lot of it mental um, here in the game of baseball for, for young aspiring pitchers. So, all right, we thank you. All right, thank you. Well, I certainly hope that you enjoyed that. Again, check us out at thepitchershop.com. You can find more of this kind of information on that website. And then you can check us out at YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, the social media sites with the handle at The Pitcher Shop. And if you have any interest in becoming a mental skills coach, please check out the excellent Applied Sport and Psychology program at Dominican University of California. They have a master's and certificate program offered both on campus and online. And again, you can find more information on Dr. Lee there. Join us in the next episode. We have a great guest, and that's the head coach, Greg Moore. He is the head coach of the Division I program at St. Mary's College in Moraga, California. They are in the West Coast Conference. Coach Moore was a pitching coach for a number of years at the Division I level and then has been a, a head coach at St. Mary's College in California for uh, they're going into his fourth year now. So we hope you tune in to the next episode. And again, that's going to be filled with a lot of information about his program and his viewpoints and what he's looking for in pitchers. And I hope that you can take some good information away from that as well.